Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. I, this is my first in-person SANS ICS Summit. I've, I've done the virtual uh, the last three years, and I have to say, and I'm not just saying it because I'm on stage, but this conference was very inspirational for me in building this program and communicating it to our leadership team. When it comes to operational technology and especially cybersecurity in that, we all know what needs to be done, but where it falls down oftentimes is how and communicating it to the business. So while I probably could talk about, I could talk for 30 minutes on each one of these topics, I mean, you're gonna get a lot of information in a short amount of time. So about me, a little bit about me. I've been in, I'm not a technologist by trade. I'm not an engineer. I started as an operations guy in banking and financial services. Usually when I say banking and financial services, everybody heads for the exit. So thank you for not doing that. Um, moved into healthcare. I actually came into the cybersecurity realm by virtue of information governance and operational risk after the financial crisis in 08. So I have extensive experience in process design, business operations, finance, project management, all of which have served me well, especially in trying to build a business case. So today I wanna to take you through a journey and it starts with the process that I used because I said I'm a process guy, I would probably spreadsheet the grocery list if I could, and I may have, I'm not gonna fully admit that. And, but it starts with a process, the methodology I used with shifting the paradigm. Cyber risk is business risk, Oftentimes it's not communicated like that, but we'll talk about that. Why should they care? Why should the business care, not just about oper operational technology, but about the security of it? How to build a business case? Why should they fund it? Funding is limited. We don't have unlimited budgets and in an inflationary environment, particularly in healthcare, we can't just raise prices like other businesses. And then as we, as we go through this journey, think about considerations for building a process and a team. It starts with a process, it starts with a team, and then it goes to technology. So what do you select for technology to help with this journey? Because that will be a foundation. And then of course, establishing a baseline. We're, since this is the 40th anniversary of Return of the Jedi for all you Star Wars fans out there, I have to, I have to make a, a Death Star reference while I'm up here that I'm happy to say our program is under construction, but operational, if that makes sense. Um, and let me let me also say that it's it's a journey. So your your mileage may vary. I encourage you to talk to me at any point, but as we go through this, if you have questions, please let me know. So the process that I used. So very simple idea. All all great things come from an idea, right? Um, initial socialization, starting to put feelers out there. Are people even interested in this? Do they think I'm crazy? I started working on this in June of 2020. And I'm happy to say that we were, it started as an idea, June, July-ish of 2020, that initial socialization, we were funded as a program by September of 2021. So in healthcare, that is like warp speed, light speed, sorry, crossing science fiction genres there. Um, drafting a program outline, what are we actually gonna do with said program when you give us the money? Where this talk really picks up is in step four, the review with leadership, testing the concept and launching. So when we talk with leadership, it starts with shifting the paradigm. As I said earlier, cyber risk is business risk. And all too often, we're very familiar with the fact that I refer to it as color wheel risk. We go in and we see green, yellow, red. We're not really sure how to trend green or red but we know that red is bad and green is good. And we're not really sure what questions to ask because it's conveyed in technical terms. And that's brought up in a few talks this morning. To be effective, it has to be, and by it, I mean cybersecurity risks, cyber risks linked back to strategic priorities and business priorities. Without that, no one's gonna know why it's important and they may not care. I also lead the vulnerability management team at Advocate, and we've now merged. So we're a large, very large health system in the country. 
And the metric that was used by my predecessor in vulnerability management was total vulnerabilities. So you take that in front of an executive or the board and you go from 6 million one month to 4 million the next month, they're gonna ask, is that good? They don't really know. There's no context. And the reality is there is no rhyme or reason. It could have just been 4 million that month. Likewise, if it goes up to 8 million, it doesn't mean you didn't necessarily do your job. The other element is that far too often we're speaking in technical terms. Remember the people that we're communicating to, especially at the board level are experts in their domain. They're not necessarily technical experts or cybersecurity experts. They may know enough to be dangerous, but if you communicate in terms that they know and understand, you'll go far, you'll have far greater impact with them versus just the pure technical speak. So not to continue to dump on cybersecurity because I'm a practitioner and it's not my intent. It does start with a fundamental question that if we don't know what we have, where it is, how it's used or who's using it, on top of if we don't know how it, what it's connected to from a business process perspective, how do we know that we're protecting the business? How do we know that we're protecting the right things? We could be protecting something completely non-essential. I work in healthcare. So OT takes a different meaning because it's they're, they're legitimately our lives at stake. On top of that, we have the medical device component that in other fields, other infrastructure isn't, isn't there. So we wanted to change the way we think about risk. And I love the little devil guy, so I just, I just had to include it. But understanding in business terms, what does a bad day look like? What's, what breaks if that happens? Is it all, all hell breaking loose or is it manageable? And then how much do we lose? So for example, if in one of our largest hospitals, I'm from Wisconsin, yes, it's still cold there, just pointing that out. Uh, in fact, it might be snowing today, no lie. Um, in one of our largest hospitals, we have a JCI medicine system, runs the building automation. So if that goes down, we lose our patient towers, we lose our surgical suites, we lose fire suppression, we lose fire detection. Basically, we're going to evacuate that hospital and we're going to close it. Now that's pretty easy to understand, especially if that hospital, and these are all round numbers for easy math on stage, generates a million dollars a day and it takes 90 days to get that back up and running that's a very public loss of $90 million. Not to mention fines, uh, reputational damage, lawsuits, et cetera. Previously, we've had engineers communicate that in terms of PLCs and head ends and the board and executives don't know what that is. They don't know what to do with that information, but they know what it means if we have to close a facility. And it isn't about generating fear, it's, a, it's about putting in re, a, a reality dose, basically. So to do that, you have to also make sure that you're engaging with the right people. Get out there a little. I know as cybersecurity people and IT people, OT people, we like to, we like to stick amongst ourselves. I encourage you to get out there and mingle. I, I, I've done it. Coming from the business side, it's a little bit easier, but you have to talk to finance. What's important to the business? Legal, what are the legal implications? Compliance and privacy, they're gonna be your best friends. Not to mention human resources, business operations. We'll talk about why that's so important down the road. So why should the business care about OT security? We're starting to paint a picture. This is part of that initial socialization and and getting people on board. We're starting to, to whet their appetite about why they should care. Well, we all know of the challenges in, in securing OT. We know as practitioners, they don't know. And a lack of, a lack of device inventory is going to shock no one in this room. And, and in most cases, at least in my industry, you have a handful of people that even know where everything is and they, they've compiled it on a spreadsheet. Well, manually gathered inventories are, are out of date as soon as they're complete. 
in most cases, it will take it will take months, if not years, to acquire them. And some of them, like the one, I kid you not, by the person that created, they affectionately called it the chicken pox diagram, because that's what it looked like, all these little dots on a, on a sheet. Unreadable, unusable. Again, the technology is different from IT, and we've talked about that. I've heard that multiple times this year, as well as, as others. So people don't necessarily understand the controls. They don't understand that we could still be rocking equipment from the Clinton administration, and the, the controls are antiquated. It has outdated hardware and software. Medical devices, the, the tech refresh on some of these devices isn't exactly short, but it's, it's long. I mean, it could be 10 or 15 years. You have, you have embedded operating systems, which isn't atypical, but you could have Windows-based operating systems, which when you look at a workstation attached to an MRI, that's a very challenging thing when the workstation is running Windows XP or Windows 7, but they can still get parts for the MRI. So how do you, how do you convince them not to run up that technical debt and, and lastly, poor network segmentation. That's not just a healthcare problem or a financial services problem or a specific industry problem. That's an everybody problem. And it's, it's where you have IT and OT commingled assets. You may, have, you may have outdated equipment. You, if I had a dollar for every time I heard from someone that it's okay, it's behind a firewall, I could have flown my private jet here. To the, to the conference. Um, in 2005, that might have been enough. In 2023, it's not a good strategy. So this on the screen, I included this in the business case with the board and executive leadership when I pitched this program. So this screen is from a ransomware attack on a MedRAD system. And for those of you that may not be familiar, a MedRAD system is used for PET-CT and other nuclear medicine, it manages contrast and radiation dosage. So this is, a, this is a huge problem if it's unavailable. And again, it's not about scare tactics, but it's, it's educating people that know because we're healthcare and we're, we're based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin or Chicago, Illinois, that it, we're not on anybody's radar, that people forget about us, that nobody's, nobody's into healthcare, that it can and does happen. No, this isn't us, full disclaimer. Um, uh, but it, it underscores the importance of this. Imagine if you were on that table. Imagine if your loved one was on that table. In healthcare, we do deal, like I said, with life and death. And this really drove home the point. And again, it's not about generating fear. It's about educating them that anybody can be a target. So. Wrapping this back to strategy, this program, like any other effective program, needs to balance security with enterprise objectives. We don't have unlimited money in healthcare, as I said. In this economic environment, we certainly can't just raise rates or raise prices. But we have to meet regulatory obligations. We have to meet patient and customer needs. We have to, we have to meet operational needs. And so that really is our true north. So when we were, when I was building this program and we were communicating it, I started with my immediate boss at the time and then started to socialize it up the chain. And everything we do to this day, now 15 months in, 16 months in, is guided by these three principles. So it's, it's always a balance of if we're going to do something, does it fall into one of these three categories? And if it doesn't, should we really be doing it? And that's financial stewardship, patient or customer safety, and data privacy and security. Data privacy does apply to healthcare. We have HIPAA, but there's also some other, I think last I counted, there's no fewer than what, 18 or 20 states that are coming up with data privacy laws similar to CCPA that will in some, in some way, shape or form impact healthcare. And financial stewardship plays a huge role when you're accounting for ICS gear, you're talking about medical devices, just to replace, we have 27 hospitals pre-merger. So if we had to replace everything in those hospitals that was 
that was nearing end of life or met you know a, a certain timeline, let's say every 10 years, given the price of some of this equipment, think about how many, how many infusion pumps you need. Think about how many patient monitors. We've all been in the hospital at some point or we've had a loved one in there. Or if you have kids, you, you know for, for a fact how many just fetal monitors there are, right? That, that could be upwards for our size hospital of half a billion dollars if you had to replace everything. So we'll talk in a minute, but there is a better way. And it comes back to some of the financial metrics and linking this back to what the business does. I'll give you a real world example of that. So in the end, as we're building a business case and we're demonstrating to executives, this is what I'm going to do for you. And I did feel a little bit like a sales guy, um, not in a bad way, but getting them to, to buy in, getting them to, to sponsor it. We, all the things that we lack is what this program can deliver in time. And I'll, I have a confession to make that that true north on the last slide is, is great, of great importance. I have, I'll show you in the baseline a methodical approach that we're taking. But I have, a, I have a tendency to, like a typical Wisconsinite expecting a blizzard, that I want to go start shoveling the, the two feet of snow, right, immediately. You can't. You have to start with a small section and move on. And that's one of the things you'll hear me repeat a couple of times is balancing progress with perfection, prioritizing what is your critical tasks for the moment and then moving on to the next list. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. It doesn't mean that you're high maturity. It just means that you've reached a level where you're good enough that you can move on. So once we understand our, that we have a risk problem, now we need to understand it in the context of the business that we support and its objectives. What would a manifestation of risk do to impact its mission, to impact its patients, to impact its customers, to impact the world? We want to demonstrate that our security investment is appropriate, that we're using the tools that we have, and I mean really using them, not just we implemented it, checked the box, and we're good to go, but really using it, analyzing the data, demonstrating that, that risk is being managed effectively, that we can test the assumptions of what we deem to be effective risk management, and that we can pivot if needed as conditions change that not only do we have regular assessments, but we're really kicking the tires. Again, not like roadhouse style, but that we're actually kicking like, like tires to go look under the hood and ask the right questions from the right people. And then demonstrating that we're crisis ready. In the example that I used earlier, you know, do we have a DR program for operational technology? That's a fair question. That's a very fair question. And it's very eye-opening to most people if they assume that you do and you don't. There's some value right there because that also helps you prioritize your first, your first initiatives. So here's my journey. Um, again, your mileage may vary as you look to build programs, but this is what we did. So like I said, I'm a process guy and I think about it in terms of building blocks that I love keeping things simple. Simple is infinitely scalable. Simple is easy to manage. Simple is easy to explain. And if you don't keep it simple and you start adding layers of complexity, don't have 10 steps when four will do. Start small, add on. Develop a scalable process. Simple allows scale. You, can, you may start with one area today, but you can add branches to a very simple process. Hiring great people. I'm going to talk about my process in a little bit, but we all know that there's a, a technology or a, I'm sorry, a talent shortage in cybersecurity because we keep looking for the wrong skills. And if we want people that understand and can, can communicate risk from a business perspective, we may just have to look in the business for cybersecurity talent. And lastly, implement technology. Technology is intentionally last because it is a tool. If you don't have a good process and you don't have good people, all the technology in the world is not going to save you. And there are far too many businesses that go technology first, that technology for whatever reason gets pulled out three years later because the contract doesn't renew 
And then they're left going, now what? They have to redesign an entire process because they put technology first and hung a process on it. So let's talk about designing a process. I love this quote, partially because I have a six-year-old, so he's a good sounding board, just you know, as a reference if you have kids. Um, but if you can't explain it to a six-year-old that they understand it, you don't either. And so as we built a process, it was, it was human-centric. It's accounting for what we knew, what we didn't, who we had in roles, where we needed to explore, and, and who would have to carry out the work. I was very transparent with our executive team when I was making this business case that as we started to kick over rocks, as we started to implement technology and get reports and conduct analysis, we could not just unring the bell. Meaning that once we knew where there were problems, we had to do something about them. Otherwise, if we didn't, in the event of an incident, we would become both victim and accomplice because we knew something and didn't do anything about it. As we designed the process, making it scalable, we didn't know what kind of technology we were gonna have at the time. We also didn't know what other components beyond IOMT and, and OT would be hanging on there and, and being strategic. Set strategic goals. Don't try to do everything all at once, it, it, I, and I'm speaking from experience. You look around the corner and you see this to-do list of everything that, that you need, right? Because every you see everything on the IT side and it is not a simple copy paste from IT to OT. Like, let's just use those resources. You have to have OT specific knowledge, OT specific processes. So in essence, you almost have to replicate everything on the IT side, on the OT side to garner that, that responsibility, right? And that experience. And I'm a big fan where, where it makes sense to use vendors to supplement that and third parties because it'll get you further along the maturity curve faster than if you try to build everything yourself. So our areas of focus in, in no particular order, risk identification, training and awareness, not just for our executive team and our leadership, but for people on the ground. For people that do the jobs every day, why should they care about cybersecurity? Why should they care about planned outages and regular maintenance schedules? Why should they actively manage their vendors? A baseline assessment, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, we, um, we're actively doing that. And I, I think you'll find the results very interesting. An asset and data inventory. When I mentioned the concept of a data inventory, people looked at me like I was crazy because an asset inventory is hard enough. but this is my information governance hat kicking in. You need to know what you're collecting and why and who has access to it, right? And, and, and the list goes on and on, right? Eventually incident response, eventually DR, eventually um, uh, drawing a blank. <laughs> eventually, eventually you'll get into all the other pieces, right? So building a team, I wanted a team that if they had technical chops, great. If they didn't, I just need a good attitude. I need them to, be, to have a good attitude. I need them to want to learn. I need them to be hardworking. We can deal and train with the technical aspects, but if, if they don't want to learn, if they think that they know everything, that's really going to be difficult to manage. So while I still have openings, we're building a team slowly and steadily. When we selected technology, we're, we've implemented or are in the process of fully implementing the technology that we picked. We had to define our requirements up front. We, we, could, not, we could not just go in through the marketing speak and say, hey, we'll solve everything for you. We conducted a POC, which I would recommend to everybody, conduct a POC. Don't, don't just take the, the technology from shelf back to, uh, back to implementation. And why I encourage to design your process ahead of time is use the POC to test your process. Does the tool fit what you're trying to do? When you kick the tires, does it actually meet what they say they can do? Does it actually meet what you want to do? And if nothing does, do you need to adjust your process or go on to the next tool? 
and then build a solid business case around the selection. And the one thing, if I would have you take away anything else from this, is when you do implement technology or buy it, use it, use it. I, I hear from so many of my peers that they've implemented technology and a technology solution and they don't use it at all. They don't really even know what it does anymore because the person that, that signed the contract isn't there. And that's, that's a tremendous waste of money. So establishing the baseline. I think this is so critical to knowing what your current state is before you just jump right into the deep end of the pool, trying to do risk assessments, trying to identify critical assets. You have to do all of those things, but you need to know what the current state and what you're, what you're walking into basically. And another quote, I'm a quote guy, sorry. Um, but I find this to be so true that in cybersecurity, especially we discount what we think we know is secure, like my firewall example from earlier. Or, and and we, we focus on the new and shiny too often. And we forget that it's sometimes the things that we think are secure that really aren't. And this doesn't even account for the unknown. So we wanted to separate reality from fiction. And I find that as you move through an organization, and when I said earlier about getting out and mingling, I meant it, about having conversations with people at all levels of the organization. If you start with a VP or a director, you only go to that level, they're gonna tell you what they think happens. If you talk to the manager, they're gonna tell you what should happen. But when you talk to the people who do it every day, they're gonna tell you what actually happens. And that's the data that we want. Because then that helps us form the baseline to say, here's what we have, here's why you should care, and here's what we're gonna do about it. So it's, it's the what, so what, now what? So we're transitioning from what is to what should be. And as I said, this is, this is in progress. We've, we've completed different segments. We're doing it by modality. And I'm happy to say that everything's fine and there's no problems at all and not really any lessons to be learned whatsoever. Um, everything's fine. But in reality, we uncovered things that, that call them sacred cows, call them you know, truths that people believe to be true, just weren't so. We found out that maybe we're too single threaded that maybe we have one or two people that know everything that they really, they're really crippling the organization that if they would leave, so does all that knowledge. So we started asking more and more questions about what does this equipment actually do? What does it support? What clinical process does it support? What site does it support? And imagine being able to map a, a BAS to the data center that it's housed in, to all of the sites that it supports. That was something that our executive team had never seen before. They just knew that there were a bunch of them out there. But now we can actually map site by site. Do we even know where to look or who to ask? Is there an asset owner? Who's managing the vendor? What's documented? And what happens if we can no longer utilize it? which brings up a, a good point I mentioned earlier in my, my, fi my financial stewardship component, right? There's usually, when you're talking about technical debt, particularly with medical devices, it, it's very binary. Either you have to replace it or you don't. That's how it's viewed by leadership and, and finance, especially. But I offer a third alternative, and that's one of the unsung benefits of a cyber risk program for OT, and this was one of the benefits of my program, is asset utilization. Now, this doesn't apply necessarily to a billing automation system, but it does apply to medical devices. So if you have a medical device that is running outdated hardware, or it's outdated hardware, outdated software, it's a high risk, but it's underutilized, you can just get rid of it. And that really is, fairly inexpensive versus investing in new to replace it or in segmenting, which also has cost considerations. So our approach was about documenting the current processes and controls. And again, we weren't internal audit, we were asking questions. And if a process didn't exist, 
except in somebody's head, that was okay. We just wanted to know what is. We didn't want to know the ideal state. What controls are there? Are there any controls? Are there not? Scary if there weren't, but you have to ask the question. Understanding how things are configured to just say that, well, I know how it's configured and that's good. Well, but what happens if you win the lottery tomorrow? No one else will know. Who's managing the vendors? Vendors have to be managed. You can't just assume that everything goes according to plan and they're gonna patch as needed. And then what happens in the event of a cyber attack? So the aforementioned JCI system, people never walked that line. They would just see it as a budget item and then veto it if there wasn't cash available, right? Or the MedRAD system, investing in training, investing in equipment, investing in the right places is critical. Identifying gaps. Again, we're not, in, we're not audit, but we need to know where we have gaps so we can prioritize. We're focused on resiliency, not about trying to plug every hole. So in closing, I think, as I said, one size doesn't fit all. This was, this was, these were the steps that we took. This was what it took for us to get support, but it's a journey. It's an ongoing journey. So prioritization and education are key. You have, to, you have to communicate in business terms and tell them why they should care. Form strong internal partnerships. Go outside of IT. Learn about finance. Learn about what privacy and compliance, what's on their radar, what legal is focused on. Those groups will be your staunchest allies because finance has the wallet. So if they know what you're doing, they'll help you get the funds that you need and balance progress with perfection. I've said it a few times, it's a journey. You can't do this all at once. We've been at it 15 months. And while I'm happy compared to where we were a month after we started, we have a long, long way to go. But we continue to make strides and, and we reach a point of this is good enough and 100 is better than zero. So we don't need to get to 1,000 tomorrow. And with that, I thank you for the time this afternoon and if there are any questions. Thanks.